you seem like you're already saving money from Medicare. So there's less opportunity. Yes. So declining ones, I, I should have said, are where you have the easiest opportunity. And so just because uh, a trend is flat or increasing, that doesn't necessarily tell us, okay, don't pick this episode. If it's declining, then the hospital has the opportunity to pursue what John refers to as arbitrage. Um, yeah. I mean, theoretically, so, so this is what you'd love to have happen. Your baseline was July from 2009 through June 2012. And that's what get, that's what, how your target is set. They trended forward, so it's the, the for, Changes in payment or, uh, payment rates and things like that. You know, what what I'd love to see because I'm a finance guy is that trend is flat all the way up till the end of 2012 and then starts going down because you've implemented a whole bunch of stuff since the baseline and it's working and you're going to get credit for all of that happening. And I've, we've actually seen that where someone's uh, implemented a uh, care management strategy or switching uh, uh, post discharge provider strategy. In the beginning, it was a conscious decision, the beginning of 2014 or the beginning of 2013. So the costs are already coming down. And because of the way the BBCI is designed, your baseline is that 2009 to 2012 period, you get credit for that. Okay? That's what you'd like to see. If the trend is going up, it means you've got to reverse it. You've got to change what you've already been doing to raise costs to bring it flat. Actually, you've got to bring it down 2% below flat because you've got to catch that that discount you're giving away, and then bring it back down. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay, and again, John and I are the financial analytics folks, so we're just seeing where the data tells us there's opportunity. Then we bring in, as he said, Dr. Colleen Kimblehan, who says, well, it asks a number of clinical follow-up questions, how their management programs are currently structured, and we have a number of hospitals, actually, that are going live in January that have increasing trends, but after we've dug in and more to understand what was driving that trend up, we've then decided that that's something that we can impact and are committed to trying to turn the line the other way. So again, it's more of a literal uphill battle, but this is just beginning the discussion and seeing where, where the easy opportunity might be. I had one situation where we looked, we, we saw a significant uptick in major joint replacement costs in 2014, and when we dug into it, we found that they started using inpatient rehab in 2014 where they weren't using it before. And the SNF hadn't gone down, home health hadn't gone down, just inpatient rehab was going up. And the guy said, oh yeah, we just formed a new strategic alliance with an inpatient rehab hospital and we're sending in more patients. Well, yeah, that's gonna kill you. I mean, um, it, it may be the cl right clinical thing to do, and if it is, you gotta drop out of this bundle because you're now adding costs to the bundle that wasn't in the baseline, and you're not taking out anything else. So in that sense, you know, there were two strategies going on there that weren't talking to each other. You know, and it was clearly evident to us that this was, this was you're gonna fail in this bundle if you continue that strategy. Go ahead. Yep, so if there aren't any other questions, uh, we want you to please look at your packets, and you know, we, we did not anticipate at the same time as the CMS session. Although we think you're in the best session. <laughs> so you now all have the ability to look at all these different episodes and we want you to be looking at the data and thinking about these questions. You know, where is there a risk? If you were running your hospital and had all the power, which actually some of you might, um, would you go live with this episode? Would you take risk? Um, and based on this data, what are the next questions that you would ask in order to assess if this was a feasible option for your organization? So we can pause just for a minute for you all to take time to look. But again, since we're a small group, we'll just jump in and ask that you all share your initial reflections as you look at the data and share what questions that you would want to ask next.
like I think it might be maybe like a place map so there's Americans there so and this is the readmit information about those patients that triggered the initial episode. So looking at this musculoskeletal it's probably a major joint episode. We didn't tell you that information on purpose. But readmission. Yeah. So even though they triggered the major joint episode Something might happen to them during a 90 day period mm -hmm. and they get readmitted because they're having trouble breathing. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that the provider is at a risk of me to give you a time. Mm -hmm. It's just great incentive to manage what's happening. Yeah, and so you can see when, the, when it's happening. So this is, they're coming back 13 days after they were discharged. Is there anything okay. that can be able to say for we can manage these things? This is telling you. Okay. So you're like, you know, a transplant? Like, how in the world are you supposed to prevent that? You don't even want to prevent that. Mm -hmm. You want someone to get a transplant. So this is just like helping you see of my risk, what can I affect mm -hmm. versus what is uncontrollable risk. Right. And then, but it just, this also informs our strategy. So like, like when, things cost. When, did, when did they come back with that reunion? This one came back almost 60 days later. Mm -hmm. So if I am using a care manager, I need to make sure that they're following up with the patient this far out mm -hmm. versus just stopping in that initial week. Right. But they have 90 days. Mm -hmm. So who is looking at episode one? What do you guys see in episode one? Who, who, who would like to talk about episode one? Should we tell you what it is? You know what it is? Can you figure out what it is? I'm sorry? That's it. That's it. So let's, let's learn a lot of in episode one. Great. Okay. So what's our strategy here? This is a post-acute provider strategy, isn't it? Okay, this is not really a readmission strategy. There's just not a lot of readmissions, and when we get into looking at what those readmissions are, they're not really related, they're very low volume, and, and even somebody like me, who's not a clinician, would say that's not a strategy for this. Um, we're seeing a lot of stiff, we've got, uh, we don't have a lot of 
patient rehab here. We have some, but not a lot. One of the main strategies that's worked well in places like NYU, and we can talk about it because they present a lot of publicly, is they made a decision that they were going to switch from inpatient rehab. They switch a large population of patients from inpatient rehab into SNF. And if we looked at a graph of inpatient rehab utilization over time, they go like this, literally, because I did the graph. And the SNF utilization goes up, but it doesn't go up as high. And that's one of the reasons that they're doing very well in major target placement. Um, we have a couple of hospitals that, that, one hospital owns the inpatient rehab facility. That was a very difficult decision to make for uh, the, the CFO of that hospital. And that gets into whether they've got rights of one for all that kind of stuff. Are they finding that patients are doing as well from the acute to the? Uh, yes, they are. Colleen, you want to speak to that? Yeah. Hi, I'm Colleen Kittlehan from the OMC. Um, uh, we, there's absolutely no increase in maintenance. Really striking data. So no function. function. I'm sorry. Function. Yeah. Well, no one's measuring functional status in, in this program nationally. It's ridiculous, huh? So that, that was the big care, right? That correct Exactly. And that got cut from this program nationally. So we don't know about functional status, but we do know about home health, and we do know about ER, and we do know about whether folks are going to their primary doctor. We know about other forms of utilization from claims. Exactly. And then we know um, patient satisfaction, et cetera, but we don't know true functional staff. So a serious problem in the program nationally. What we know is people aren't dying and mean, they're not coming back. We don't know whether they're functional. The age demographic, I mean, you and I would want to go to acute rehab if we have a very functional, free, operative status. Given you want to be rehabbed, right? right? I want to be rehabbed. Right. I get my knee area done. But where do I want to be rehabbed? Could I be in some of the more innovative models? Could I be at home and have the tele-PT, right, or other strategies? If I live alone and I'm in New York and I only have a walk-up, probably not. Right. I want to be somewhere and I want to be in and, in and out fast. You guys, right now, um, the, doing this bundle payment program, I'm living in Brussels for other reasons. I live in Belgium, my husband is there, and I'm working on this program. Belgium is the big joint capital of the world, right? They bring people in from all over the world. It costs $13,000 to have a hip or a knee. Their length of stay is nine days. All of the rehab is done in that setting, and then you're done. You're finished. So it's, a, it's almost a 1950s strategy, right, from the United States. So fascinating stuff about where should people be rehabbed, and what do we know about their long-term functional status? Uh, as a PM&R physician, I'm going to temper that conversation uh, that that outcome does not extend to every diagnosis. There is a new paper out, particularly about stroke, because that's obviously a neurological bunch of bundle that's really hot on the plate. It, the SNP outcome for stroke is not the same as an ERF outcome, which is an acute, ERF is acute rehab. So be careful about mincing your diagnoses because you won't get what you want uh, when you do that. Absolutely, and not only stroke, but any high-risk patient with multiple comorbidities, right? How right. they look, right. and there are to, to, to sniffs um, benefits, and there's some interesting uh, work going on right now about uh, managing comorbidities in sniff and managing rehab. So I think this is all going to blend and change over the next few years. But right on in terms of high-risk patients and/or high-risk conditions. So another piece of this that, uh, that matters, and this is purely a BPCI issue, okay? Just they have a 30, 60, 90 day episode length. And you get, uh, you only have to give up a 2% discount if you do the 90 day episode. You have to give up a 3% discount if you do a 60 or 30 day episode. What's the right choice here? I, I would not do this. Uh, I'm not sure I would do this primarily because that sniff cost would be hard to control. It looks like according to the graph that very little variation around how patients are being sent there post discharge. And so it seems like you know most of your providers are doing it that way, so the changes to get the 3% seems like it would be very hard, and I'm not sure you would get the 3% out of the cost as it stands. It's just my opinion. Okay. Um, Colleen, you want to say anything? Or, or oh, it could be. It could be. I mean, this is this is one where you know we point out what it is, and, and you guys have to decide what to what to do about it. The point that I was going to make on on you know, uh, I was going to say that the hospitals 
hospital whose data this is, is actually doing this episode. Um, and they have a really intense pack strategy, um, and they're doing 90 days, because again, the risk throughout 30 to 60 is really minimal. And so they're hoping that with choosing the right risk track and doing the 90 day episode, that they can really focus tough on the first 30 days with changing up the discharge disposition. And with this data, you have the ability to see discharge disposition by specific physician and using information like that to help change the disposition enough to get that percent savings. But how do they want to change that? I mean, what are they going to try to change? We're looking at, uh, at length of stay by skilled nursing facility. In some cases, we found that the like the stay of skilled nursing at the skilled nursing facility is directly correlated with when the patient's cocaine kicks in, uh, i.e. they'll hold them until the patient would have to start complaining about it and then they'll leave. Uh, we're seeing wide variations in length of stay at SNFs that don't seem to correlate with, uh, with any other metric we have, like the number of HCC conditions that the patient has. Um, we're seeing uh, differences in, in cost per day, which is a function of the, the rug intensity that's scored. Um, we're seeing uh, home health agencies that are, that are attempting to be much more aggressive at providing the type of care that patients would otherwise go to a skilled nursing facility uh, would see. Uh, the Lewin report that was just issued by the contractor, the CMS, uh, even in the first quarter of participation, which are only nine hospitals, they found a significant drop in SNF utilization with a uh, uh, not concurrent rise in home health utilization, significant substitution of home health utilization um, for uh, uh, for SNF services. Home health, home health agencies aren't, aren't blind to this stuff. They're seeing that this is a massive opportunity to try and change the way that they provide services. And um, we have a number of SNF clients and they're running scared. They're, what they're gonna try and do is go after the readmissions. Because you always try and take money away from the upstream provider. And that's basically the game. So they're going to try and keep the, pre prevent the readmissions. So you should go to the SNF, and the home health agency is going to say, we can do just as good a job as the SNF, uh, but a lower, at a lower cost. You should come to us. That's pretty much what's happening right now. So this was the case of, of what's there and what can you do about it. And when I look at the last the 60 or 90 days, what's there is not much. Okay, to me, this is a no-brainer for 90 days. And if we compare this to a, and this is obviously major joint surgery, if we compare this to, to a medical episode, you'll see a marked difference there, and maybe a significantly different decision. Well, this doesn't look good, does it? Um, what do we do about this? This is, this is scary. Okay, and we didn't give you the detail on this, but what we would be doing after this is drill into it and say, okay, what's happening here? You know, are, is, is SNF going up? Are readmissions going up? If readmissions are going up, it's a real problem for this DMG. We don't have a lot to begin with. Um, but we would, we would then start digging into which provider component is going up and what's driving that. This is bad enough. This might be the reason not to play. I, you know, we, I don't know what's happening here, but this is, this is they're going to have to make up an awful lot before they even break even on this stuff. I would just say that, and I know that's probably in both of your minds at this moment, is that one of the interesting reasons for this trend that we've seen nationally on joints is hip fracture percent. So the hip fractures who are going on to joints, non-elective, multiple more comorbidities, cost two to three times as much sniff and in, inpatient in rehab appropriately, much longer, 20 to 30 percent mortality in the first year, really driving this, and they're writing these in this episode, all hip fractures going to so we skipped the readmission slide on this because readmissions really aren't that much of an issue. You can, you can take a look at them if you want. Um, but episode two, what do you see here? Does it help? 